Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for Pintech Live. Kyle is out gallivanting around Disney World. So we are going to watch a seminar I recorded at Cleveland Pinball Show this month, past month, uh, with Butch Peel. He did this awesome uh, lesson and teaches us on his color matching techniques, what type of paints to buy to use on your pinball machines. And uh, I think y'all will really enjoy this program. So check it out. And also in advance, I apologize for the color of the actual seminar recording. Um, if you guys want to get the actual uh, PowerPoint presentation that Butch has, let us know in the chat we'll work to make that happen. Appreciate you all coming tonight. Uh, my name is Butch Peel. I work for the Chicago Gaming Company. Um, I worked sometime with Jersey Jack Pinball. I used to write manuals and I still do for uh, Chicago Gaming and do tech support and those sorts of things. I've done uh, some seminars here at the Cleveland Show. I think this is my third or fourth uh, show I've been to here and uh, done some um, pin tech stuff and showing how to fix games and work on them and things like that. This time I thought I'd take a little departure from that and uh, talk a little bit about color matching and paint touch up and kind of put it in a pinball context. Um, you could talk about colors and you can talk about hues and all the different characteristics of colors and things for hours and hours on end. Andy over here who does uh, clear coating and paint, painting automobiles can probably ch chapter and verse quote for for a long time but I, I'm not I'm gonna get too deep into it just some things that I discovered when I started trying to learn how to color match and touch up that I think will uh, come in handy and, and and keep things kind of on a simple plane so that that it's easy to do and it's not it's a little more approachable for someone just to walk up and say you know I think I'll, I'll, I'll touch up my my play field I, I want to give it a shot so the, the need for color matching and touch-up skills. Pinball machines, of course, we all know, beat themselves to death. A steel ball being smashed around inside a play field, a wooden play field, plastic targets, plastics around, you know, as decorative items under there. They're just going to get beat up, and you know the steel ball is going to win every time. Most of these machines that we have and love, are, we're on location on a pay-for-play setup at some point in their life, sometimes very long times in their life. And of course, the, we've seen them abused by players and neglected by operators and damaged in frequent moves because they're moving them from one of their locations to another and they drag them around, they run into door frames, they scrape into one another, they tip them up with the balls in there and things get broken. You know, it's, it's just a matter of uh, uh, the nature of the beast kind of with, with pinball machines. And of course, the, the bottom line is that these were designed and built for a very short commercial lifespan. The way Williams and Bally would have it back in the day is get, buy this new machine now, and hopefully, you know, in a couple of three years, you'll be ready to buy another new machine because that one will be a worn out, a beat up. And so they were, they were never, never uh, built. These people were, that were designing the games never thought they'd be around 40 years later. So it, it's really cool that we, we do get to play them. But... You know, it comes at a price. Um, then there's that satisfaction in restoring original pinball parts and pieces. That if you've never done it, you you know, you're missing out if you're in the hobby because it, there's really something cool about that. Taking something that was dead and making it work, something that was beat up and and destroyed, and, and returning it to its uh, former glory again. Reproduction play fields, you can put them in. They're not cheap and it's not easy to do either. That's a lot of things to transfer over from one play field to another. The cabinet decals and stencil kits are not very cheap either. And of course, when you do that, either one, there's lots of, of work in, in doing a, um, preparation for those types of complete decal stencil jobs. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we can touch up some of these different things, you know, plastics and, and um, play fields and cabinets and things like that and what, what you might use to do that. 
So how do you begin when you're going to start color matching and touching up? You need to find a project, first of all. So early on in my pinball collecting, I was able to pick up a high speed out in San Diego, California. I drove 695 miles. I paid $695. And in typical newbie you know, shape, I, I loaded the game up started driving away and I got almost on the interstate and realized I forgot the back glass because I took it out, I was afraid. So I had to turn around and go back and get it. But you know, that, that's what happens. But you can see this thing was, had a really rough lifetime and I was just happy as heck to get a, an original high speed pinball machine. This is after I started stripping the play field down just to see you know, how bad it was. It, you really have to kind of take even more than this. This is just filthy dirty. You're gonna have to strip, get down and strip and, and really scrub the play field to even see where your starting point is for, for bringing it back and, and painting and touching it up. So now I got me a project, check. Find a little intestinal fortitude. Now I've never had a problem with confidence myself. I've, I've always looked at somebody doing something and said, you know, if I, if I took the time to figure that out, I, I could be pretty good at that too. And so I, I, I kind of really keep things simple with pinball. I look at it and I say, that thing needs some attention, whatever that is, the play field, the back glass, the, the, the uh, cabinet, whatever. And then I, I try to make sure that I can make it look better than it did before. And I try and keep that simple rule in there. I'm a, I'm a perfect perfectionist way down deep, but I try to keep things simple and just say, you know, if I can make it look better, I'm gonna be satisfied. So check on the intestinal fortitude. Then I gotta buy some paint. So I go out and I, I get me some paint. No problem. Learn some lessons. That's the, the tough part. Yeah, and I learned some lessons. And yeah, quite a few check marks there because a lot of lessons learned as, as I, I started trying to do this. And then I had to go back to step three because my paint was not really what I needed. I went down to Hobby Lobby and I just said, well, you know, the, the the primary colors are blue, red, yellow, and then of course you need some white and black. So I just got these big old bottles of paint. I said, boy, this is going to be enough to do a bunch of play fields. I'm going to be in good shape. And I went back and I just started trying to mix the simplest green color for some of the, the top of that high speed play field. And when I put that blue with that yellow, it didn't come out anything like that. I tried to add a little white. I tried darkening with some black. It just it didn't help at all. It, there was no, it was nowhere near, and I'm like, I'm not, that will not look better, so I'm not going to do that. So my, the most important lesson I learned is this book that I, I found, and that is Blue and Yellow Do Not Make Green. So this is written by a, a man named Michael Wilcox, and you want to make sure if you get this book that you get the second edition here, because it's the one that's fully updated with a, a lot of color swatches. It's got color pages in it and all these different... Uh, extra lay, new layoffs and, and things that this, and, and information that the guy put in the second edition. One of my friends bought the first edition and I'm telling him, well, it's right there on page this. And he said, I don't have that page in my book. I'm like, hmm, okay. <laughs> so it, that is important, that second edition. And the most important thing that he teaches in that book is just kind of go back to the rainbow and think of how the rainbow works. It starts at one end with red, it moves into orange, it moves to yellow, and then into green, and then on into blue, and then into the indigo, and into violet, and then it wraps around and goes back to red again. So what his, his big message is, is there's not just one red that you can use, and that's what I was trying to use, is a, is a, a red that was just, come on ahead, you're all right, not a worry. There's not just one red, there's not just one yellow, there's not just one blue for those primary colors. You have to think of it the way the rainbow works. There's, there's going to be an orange red, which is off in this direction. There's going to be a violet red that's off in this direction. So there's two sides to red, and there's a kind of a, a, a in-between one in-between. But and then you go to yellow, there's an orange yellow, and there's a green yellow. So when you want to make, and then when you move into blue, there's the, uh, the violet blue and then there's the green blue. So when you want to make a really bright green, you have to use the green yellow and the green blue, mix them together and you get a really bright, vivid green color. If you want to make a bright orange, you use the orange red and the orange yellow, mix them together 
and you can get a very bright orange. <coughs> Same thing with violet. You gotta use the, the blue, violet blue and the red blue. Or, I'm sorry, the, the violet blue and the, and, the, um, and the violet red. Yeah, violet blue, violet red, yeah. I'm not wrapping around here. So, yeah, it, it, that, that really brought the, you know, it was like a light bulb going off. The clouds all parted, da-da, I knew what to do now. And it made a lot of sense, because the other big thing that he brought up is consistency in pigments. And you've got to get different pigments make up these colors, these orange reds, and then the, the one that uses for violet red, and the different pigments that they use for all these different things across, the, across that, that spectrum are, if you're gonna get good paints, you'll get good pigments and you'll get good com repeatability. So you learn how to do this once and you'll be able to do it again over and over again. So that was a big, a big uh, you know, parting of the clouds for me. So the first thing I've realized is I gotta go back to that step three and I gotta get a higher quality paint. And I, I chose the Liquitex paints. They have a soft body acrylic, which is like a medium viscosity. And they came in these little bottles. I think the bottle might have changed by now, but the, the company and the paint, you know, it's all the same. And here's like the, this is a bottle of light Hansa, which is the green yellow, yellow Hansa. They also, the big thing that I figured out as soon as I started working with Liquitex soft body paints is that they were way too thick for what I wanted to do. And trying to paint on there, it just left all kinds of brush strokes and things like that. So I read up in their book, that they um, have online. It's a really good resource. I'll show you here in just a second. But the, the, they have a, a medium called for airbrush. And so it, this is to make their paint liquid enough to spray on. So if I'm, I'm figured if it was liquid enough to spray on, it should be liquid enough to paint on really easily without leaving brush strokes. So that's what I started adding to my, to my colors. And so acrylic book here from Liquitex. This is a PDF. If you Google it, it's online. You can go in and, and uh, download the, the, it's like a 220 page uh, book that they've put together and just explains all the different things in their, their paints and all the, the ways it works and everything. The, the acrylic here, it shows in these steps here how when it comes out of the tube, when they squeeze it out of the tube, it's mixed with water, a little bit of water. And the water, these little dots are like the pigments and the, the uh, polymers are these round circles here. And then the water evaporates either through, through the uh, surface that you paint on or through the air or both. And as it does so, these little polymers things, the, the water goes away, the polymers start to get closer together and they lock into an octagonal type shape here. And then they, they create this really stable film and the pigments remain suspended in that film. And the pigments are so you know, vivid and there's so many of them, they're rich in pigments, the Liquitex paints, that's why they're not cheap, that you get a really pretty and, and durable um, mixture there. And they talk about additives like water and other additives that they actually make for Liquitex paints for artists, because these are artist colors, they're just the same stuff that the people use, the artists to make you know, portraits and things like that use. And they talked about the difference between an additive and a, a um, medium. A medium actually has a lot of the same polymer in it and it has extra of it in it so that when you add it to your paint and it thins it, it actually still strengthens that bonding capability later on. It doesn't take that away. If you put too much water in acrylic paint, you get to where these, these are, get so separated that they can't bond together very well and they make a weak film when they're done and we want a really strong film we want it to go to and stay together well so the the um, a airbrush medium actually makes it just as watery as you want to and makes it and keeps it that way and you can add as much medium as you want to to a paint which becomes very important for touch-up stuff because you want to you want to mix a color and you want to save some for later you can come back and add airbrush medium to it and keep it at a working consistency for I've done it for months while I'm doing a project. And that, that keeps me from having to try and get that perfect match again. I know every time I dip my brush in that and I put it next to the other stuff, it's gonna dry the exact same color. And that's very important. So lots of important information there. You wanna download that and take a look at it. So the really important paint characteristics are durability, of course. We want consistency and we want flow. We want quick drying time. I don't want to, to 
touch up stuff and then rub my arm across it and have it go go away as soon as I got it just the way I wanted it. And even with acrylics, I still find a way to do that. It, it, it's just going to happen. Colors are very, very, very important, and then those pigments are the are the key to those colors. Translucency and what opacity. Are are you going to be able to see through this paint when you put it over something darker? Does it cover the dark stuff behind it or does it let it show through? That becomes very important also. Um, light fastness is the last one. And th these are bottles of, uh, of Liquitex paints here and very well used ones as you can tell. I get them all over. And you start painting with paint, it's like uh, roofing, you know, you get up there with roofing, black roofing tar on your roof, you might as well just get some on your hands and smear it all over your face and your hands and your favorite shoes and you're going to get it all over everything, you don't even realize it, but, you know, so, so dress accordingly. Acrylic paint is very durable when it gets in your clothes, too, but light fastness and everything is put on, on the back of these bottles here and the opacity information and what the pigment is, it's all written in there. So I'm going to blow these up a little so you can see them. When uh, we want light fastness, because if, if we get UV light on our play fields or any kind of light, which you know an LED puts out a very broad spectrum of light, incandescent bulbs put out broad spectrum. If you've got your roof, your uh, pinball in a room with a fluorescent light, that's extremely broad. Uh, fluorescent light is an extremely broad light. And so you're going to get some UV mixed in with that, and it, we don't want our, our paints to uh, to get lighter over time and fade, like a lot of the cabinet art that we see in pinball. So you want a light fastness here. Some of these are excellent. Some of them are, you know, very good, excellent. Still, they, they give them ratings of one or two or three, and the threes are the ones that you want to stay away from. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Your uh, your yellow spectrum here this is a cadmium yellow and it shows you what dyes are used these are pigment yellow py pigment yellow this pigment white six pigment yellow three is used over here for for the yellow hansa and it shows you on the yellow spectrum where where this paint lies in this little chart over here so yellow dead center would be there more of a green yellow is that way or more of an orange yellow is this way more of a green yellow is that way, more of an orange yellow this way. So this one's slightly more into the orange and it works so much better than just that little bit of difference there. It makes a big difference when you're making, uh, trying to make a bright green color or a bright orange color. And you, you have your light fastness, you have your opacity is shown here as a translucent or transparent. If it's translucent, that means it's kind of in the middle and that means it, it'll, it, some of it will show through. It, it's, it's, got, it's got very, some transparent, um, properties to it. Very transparent here, that white square is, means that it's very transparent. So you can't take this yellow out of the bottle here. And if you've got a black line or a bunch of dirt that you're trying to cover up, a wood grain even, and paint over it and expect it to cover it, it's going to show right through it like a yellow window. Now if I go back to the t reds here, you see these are, this one is very opaque. This one red is, is about here on the spectrum, more towards the, the orange red. This one is more towards the purple red, or violet red, and it, this one's very transparent again. This red here is hard to cover things with. So the way we get around that when we, when we paint a play field, for instance, and you got all these really bright yellows and green yellow colors and these bright uh, scarlet colors, which, which this color is used a lot in play fields, what we do is we put a white film down first. We put a white layer and we paint over the top of the white layer. So the white is opaque, it covers all the wood grain, it covers anything else up, and it's another screen. You know, the old days, they, that's how the, the play fields were made. And actually, Chicago Gaming Company, I think it's the last company that still screen paints their, their play fields. And you just can't get the same color richness and saturation and it just the look if you digitally print stuff. It just doesn't look as good. But that's how we do it, is we put a white layer down and then we put the colors over the top of that the ones that are transparent especially. So a, a good recommended color palette, kind of keep it simple. Like I said, the Liquitex you know, brand has this, if you go down the Hobby Lobby uh, aisle that has Liquitex paints, or you go to an artist store, you'll see, or you go online, like Dick Blick's, one of these uh, art places online, 
you'll see this vast array of all these different colors and, and you're like, holy crap, do I need to buy one of every one of those? No, not really. You're going to mix a lot of that stuff, but there are some things that they're pre-mixed that are, that are nice to have. And that's one of them is the, the cadmium red. It's your orange red, your basic orange red, and it's pigment red 108. Violet red, which is that one I just showed a minute ago that looks very crimson. That's a quinacridone, or short, people don't like saying quinacridone, so they say acra red. And that's pigment violet 19. Orange yellow, you're, so now you've got your two reds. You've got one on either side of the red spectrum. Now you're going to get two yellows. So you have an orange yellow, which is cadmium yellow, light generally. And that's pigment yellow 35. And you're going to get a green yellow, which is a Hansa yellow, and that's pigment yellow 3. You're going to get a violet blue, which is an ultramarine blue, and it's pigment blue 29. You're going to get a green blue, so the opposite side of blue, and that's a thalocyanine, or just they call it thalo blue, and that's P pigment blue 15. This one I had a trouble, <laughs> the only other thing I could think of was, you know, infant, infant excrement, and yeah, it's, a, it's like a, that mustard, almost brownish yellow color, pigment yellow 43, and it's yellow ochre is its official name. Uh, yellow brown, it's kind of a raw sienna, and it's a mixture of three different types of pigments, a black 9, a red 101, and a yellow 42. An earthy type of brown is, is a burnt sienna. It's the same sort of pigments, but they do different things with them. When they make paint, they'll, they'll take a, the raw sienna will be like the right out of this plant, and then the burnt sienna, they'll take it and just like it says, they'll, they'll cook it and they'll heat it up and it changes color. But it, and it's very predictable what it's gonna do. So it's a very uh, um, light, fast pigment and it'll do what it's supposed to do and you can get the same stuff with the same plant every time. And that's with a, a black pigment and a red pigment 101. A very, very dark brown is burnt umber, and that's a, a pigment brown 7. And these are made, if you look up any of these, these uh, center words here on Google, you'll find out how they make, where that particular type of, uh, whether it's a man-made or whether it comes directly from, it's organic. Um, how they get those pigments. It's, it's kind of interesting reading. Titanium white is just a brilliant white, so pigment white 6. Mars black is a super deep black, pigment black 11. It's made from <coughs> iron, they say. There's another black ivory that, that they talk about that they make out of charred animal bones, believe it or not. But that, that one isn't quite as deep as, as, as Mars black. Mars black's my, my favorite black. It's a super deep black and I like a super bright white. And then to kind of help mix some of these things in, you, it's good to start with a, with a very common gray color that you can recreate really simply by squeezing some out of the bottle with a pigment white 6, pigment brown 7, and pigment black 9. No fluorescent colors, unfortunately. You can't, it's not that they don't exist, but their light fast properties are terrible, so they don't last very well. So in fact, in a Monster Bash pinball machine, I have this nice triangular plastic over here where the creature saucer is, and right there is where the little window where you can see the creature when he's shaking underneath the play film. This is a very well lit plastic because you know they want to show off this cool artwork that they've got here. So they they put three light holes under there. So there's three GI bulbs right under that one plastic, and it, it's hard to see with this yellow stuff. I tried to make it as as obvious as I could, but you'll see a line down this right here where to the right of it, it's not that seaweed green anymore, it's more of a teal color. And what happened was all the light underneath that plastic faded the fluorescent inks in this area right here and made it really, uh, it, it changed its color completely and it doesn't look right. And so my, my uh, Monster Bash play film, I'm going to show you after a while, when I, I've touched it up and cleared it, or uh, touched it up anyway, and you'll see how I repainted that whole area. Was this an original or is she talking Yeah, an original. Oh, okay. Original. Let's see, paint brushes. Buy cheapo paint brushes here. The big old 144, yeah, Amazon.com is your friend. 144 of them for 399 or something. Ages three and up, I fit that criteria just fine, so I'm good, I'm ready to paint, right? Save money for painting brushes. Save your bucks. These are the kind of brushes that I recommend and I use all the time. They have a very 
thick handle. They make, that makes such a big difference when you're painting in terms of, of fatigue in your hand, if you have a thick handle like that. And they're a Simmons brand. It's an E8115-0, which is a size zero spotter, which is my tiny fine detail brush. And then a E5110 size zero <coughs> liner, which has much longer bristles, but still comes to a super fine point. And so they're, they're kind of interchangeable, but those liners are just really nice because you could lay those long bristles down and just drag them along and they make the, the most perfect line, as long as you can keep your hands still. So it's, just, it's, a, it's a skill, it is a skill. And just to show you the difference between the cheapo brush tips and these fine brushes, I put them up together there. Now protect that investment. Um, these, most these brushes, if they don't come with some kind of a plastic, you know, straw cover, keep those from getting smashed when you put them in your drawer or set them on your desk or whatever. Get one. You can make a piece of uh, of heat shrink tubing. Cut a little piece of heat shrink tubing. Is all I did for that one, and it just sticks right on the end of it, and it stays. And you need to point these brushes. Keep them pointed. And the best way to point them remains. Uh, most artists know you lick your brush, so you clean it. You wash it out, you get it nice and, and, uh, and clear, and then you put a little saliva on it, and that's what keeps the bristles together over time. and doesn't let them just go like your hair does in the morning if you don't shave, you know, get out of the shower and you don't comb it down. It'll just stick out. That's what your brushes will do. And once they start doing that, it's really hard to get those bristles to, to, be, uh, to cooperate again. Surface preparation. So on play fields, you want to clean the surface very thoroughly. You're not waxing it. You're not getting ready to, to play it. You're cleaning it for another purpose, and that's to, to resurface it. So you want to clean it, get all the gunk you can out, the best things to use for that up front. I, I, I use some mean green every once in a while, but when you've got a play field that's coming apart already and it doesn't have any clear to protect it, I wouldn't use mean green on that. You would use these uh, magic erasers is a good one. Um, you can start by by cleaning the, the paint that's still there with like Novus number two and clean that off and then use the, the um, magic eraser to go over the top of that and you get all the deep down ground in dirt because any of that that's present in like yellows and whites and things like that, you're gonna have to cover those up with paints if you're gonna touch them up. So you want the, the, the original paint, even if you're, you start, you'll see on the, a magic eraser, you'll see, see some of the paint start coming up with it and your magic eraser will start turning blue or green or, or yellow, you know, and you know then you're getting down into the paint and you, you're doing pretty good at cleaning. Remove any uh, mylar or any adhesives, you, you're not going to be painting over those. So if you can get the, 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 the goal with mylar is to get it up without bringing the adhesive with it. Leave the adhesive on the play field if you can. That's what the cold sprays and things like that are for, is to, to cause that to think to delaminate and separate from its adhesive. Leave the adhesive behind. Then you can go along behind and clean the, uh, the adhesive off later. After you've got the adhesive and everything all cleaned off, the, you want to sand the surface. I, I usually use one of these uh, sanding blocks that 3M makes. These are rubber, hard rubber, so you just pull up on these two opposite edges like that. You pull them up and there's like three teeth sticking through right there. You put a piece of sandpaper on, you line it up and it pushes onto those three teeth. Then you stretch it around to the other side, you lift the opposite side up, you pull it up and you let it close on that and it has three more um, like nails sticking, teeth sticking in there and it holds it really solid. And then you have a nice perfectly flat sanding surface to to move around on your on your play field. 800 grits usually pretty good. I have gone as low as 600 and 400 when you're wanting to do special um, you know areas that are that are very stubborn like the shooter lanes and things like that and when you're actually going to try and take some of the wood with you on some of the shooter lanes I'm going to show here a, a special trick that I've learned over the years for a shooter groove in the shooter lane I'll use three quarter or half inch or half inch EMT, PVCs, things like that, and just stretch a piece of, of sandpaper around it and then just go up and down the shooter groove. And as you get closer to the end, you need to use a smaller and, and kind of get into the, to the shorter part of the V. You can use a, this guy to get some really stubborn black stuff out that, that, um, that ends up um, accumulating there over time. A lot of times where the ball kicks out and 
pounds around there right at the end of the shooter groove. And sometimes it'll even, you know, put take chunks out of the side. So if you can take a, a three quarter inch piece and and use a a uh, 400 grit sandpaper back there, you can sand that groove down and take it down a little bit to where those are not so uh, dominant anymore. I've seen them so bad on games where they they actually affect the way the ball shoots. I mean, the ball settles in these little ruts that are back at the back of that and when it kicks it fires them out of it and it goes airborne rather than following the V of the shooter like it's supposed to. And of course this back up to the adhesive this is what you get the adhesive off is, is naphtha. And this is actually lighter fluid so it's very 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 flammable. Uh, you want to if you're in your shop you're in your garage whatever and you're using naphtha and you're soaking rags and you're getting adhesive off and it's you're just making a big pile of them in the trash you're making a, a time bomb there be careful very careful especially if you're a smoker things those like that make sure you empty your trash very often and you, you don't let those things just sit around because they, they they soak up just enough of that stuff to just go up really easy but the great thing about naphtha and there is a p in there or there is an h in there the people try and say it's naphtha or it's naphtha no, it's, it's naphtha, or unless, you know, if you're from the southwest like me, they call it la naphtha, evidently, but, you know, <laughs> don't expect the guy at Home Depot to speak Spanish. So, naphtha is, leaves no residue whatsoever when it's done. And you use uh, all these uh, lemon and these oily type adhesive removers, they leave a nasty film afterwards, and you don't want any kind of oils, no kinds of uh, film at all to go under your clear coat or your, your touch-ups because it just it, it affects all the adherence to the wood. You want everything to, to work just like it should. So naphtha is the best stuff. I get that at Home Depot or Lowe's, those types of stores. I've gotten to where I use that little can. I bought a big gallon of it just and pour and keep using the little can because I just you just take it and pull the lid off and paper towel and turn it upside down once on the paper towel and, and it's pretty well soaked. You don't want to pour it onto your play field or anything like that. I found with the adhesive a lot of times, get your thumbnail, your nails need to be cut, just let them grow out a little bit and you can flatten them right down by cutting, taking that adhesive off of play field with your thumbnail. Plastic razor blades, now that's a great thing for that. Not the metal ones, the plastic ones. And they actually get right under that and just you can just peel it right off. And you'll need to get, get you a bright light and look in an angle and when you see that you take uh, any kind of uh, mylar off and the play field underneath is going to be very shiny like it was brand new and you'll see any spot where you can feel with if you run it over your, your fingers over it you can feel the any leftover adhesive that needs to be gotten off of there and you can see it in light and stuff too so constantly going back and forth until you absolutely sure all that stuff's off and then do the sanding after that so you're going to sand after you've got all the adhesive loose and that's when you're going to scuff up and give that that uh, paint a tooth something to hold on to when you put it down so that's a very important step too and like Andy was saying earlier if you're going to have your play field clear coated it's got to be sanded all over so that they don't have to sand it and try to sand it with with touch-ups and, and protect your artwork when they uh, go to put clear on because a clear will just delaminate too if it doesn't have anything on the surface to grab any other surfaces that we're going to use, we're going to clean them really well. We're going to remove any flakes of old paints, things like that. And we're going to use naphtha as our final prep to remove the oils and get them ready to paint. Wood repairs. If you've got a monster bash and your mosh pit hole looks as bad as this one or your drag track looks like that, you need to get some wood repair skills. Uh, first thing you want to do is, is learn how to use quick wood. This is a good stuff. They, they sell it at... Uh, Pinball Life, you can order it, you know, through the mail. And it looks like one of these vanilla Tootsie Rolls, basically a big one. Uh, but you open it up and pull it out, and it's got a plastic wrapper around it. So you just lay it down on your bench, and you take a single blade razor, razor blade or a razor blade knife, and you just slice you off a piece, kind of uh, judge how much you're going to need. And when you, once you slice it off, then you take and wet your fingers, and then you you uh, squeeze and, and knead it in your hand until it's all the same color, that tan color and that white color go together and it just makes a, an off tan color. Then you've got you know 10 to 15 minutes to work with it before it starts to harden. 
and you keep your fingers, a, a little cup of water there, and keep your, dipping your fingers in it, and you can just smooth it with your, your thumb and your fingers. And you want to make sure that there's more than what you need there because you're going to sand or, or scrape off what you don't need. You want it to come back to level. You don't want to try and make it level on that first pass. You want to get too much there so that you can take it off. I use a single blade razor blade or single edge razor blade for that exact purpose, and uh, it allows me to to just stay on the surface of the of the clear coat that's there. I, you know, the, when I sand a, a play field and get ready to to uh, to touch it up, it's still got quite a bit of cl old clear coat on it. So I just scrape right along the top there, and you can bring you can shave that quick wood down until you get it nice and flat, and then kind of sand it a little bit too and rough it up for the for your painting. And an X-Acto knife, you can get into round like the oblong holes for targets and things like that and make sure that once you fi fix one of those holes and you, you can uh, round out the corners again and make it look like it did from the factory. Very strong stuff, too. It works really well. If you've got um, scoops and saucers, drains, the, you know, the shooter lanes, those kind of things where, where you've just got splintering wood, you can take water-thin uh, super glue. And you can just soak it in there, and you can just watch the wood drink it up. It just gets darker and darker, and it, it's taken all that, that glue into the fibers. And when it sets up, it, it's very, very strong, and, and it makes a good base for starting with your quick wood. If you're going you're gonna, to um, touch up, or if, even if you're not going to touch up or clear coat, it, it'll prolong the life of your, your saucers and scoops and the holes around them. So here's some wood repairs I've done. There was a couple of... That's off of Batman Forever, I think. And the, there were a couple of these big uh, sleeve posts around this target right here. And they had been allowed to get loose over time. And when the ball keeps hitting them, they just keep getting further and further bent back. And before long, they wall out a big old hole here. And in fact, this one got into that one where I couldn't even fix it without you know, recreating the edge of this hole. And then I just filled it all in and then re-drilled the holes through it to put my post back in. And the way I redrilled it was take a piece of plywood and set it over the top that I had already taken on my drill press and made a perfectly straight up and down hole through. And when I, I lined it up with the where I wanted to make my hole in there and I it kept my drill straight up and down as I go through so I don't end up with a post that ends up on an angle or something like that, right? And here's my Monster Bash play field, which I, I did a lot of touch-up work on. and. You know, most of what I did on, on my Monster Bash was around inserts and things. The blacks, you know how they get cracked, and there, there were places along here that were really bad. So I, I ended up doing a lot of, of uh, wood tone type painting, too. The, up at the top of the play field where the three dig lanes are, the DIG lanes, they were all the, the switch slots were all just beat to hell. And so I, I took and uh, you know, put some quick wood in around those and I reformed them and made them the way I wanted them to be. And then when I came back with, to make it everything match and do the right color, I, I painted a, a match the wood tone by matching my colors. And then I painted this area and I saved that up so in a, in a cup so that I would have some to, to paint as I went around the play field. First, I'm gonna show you this area here where I, I actually did the quick wood back around the back of that. The, snubber bracket sits up here and it keeps the ball it, it actually hits here it fall it doesn't completely jump over the hole all the time so it sinks in a little hits that back edge of the hole and then pops up into the snubber and then falls in and so it, it damages the back of that hole there and so i was able to fill that in and use a razor blade and my sanding and things like that to to get it to where it's nice and smooth and it matches the contour of everything around it and then I paint it, I touch it up, and I use the wood tone color that I did there. I touch up, I airbrush the green around here, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit too, and uh, touched up the blacks and things, and it looked really good. This is around the mosh pit hole, all three sides, three of the back sides. That one was really extensive. You can see all three sides. I, I did these three sides here. S took my razor blade and scraped that nice and flat and then sanded it down, and then touched the whole area up, redid the artwork around with a little black, did the wood tone around it, did the track track while I was in the neighborhood, and moved on. That purple was a little bit difficult to match, but it worked out. Mixing paint. So you want to mix small amounts of paint on a piece of acetate. I just buy, well, actually, I, what I did was when we, when 
in the old days you used to use uh, laser jet uh, transparencies to make view graphs and things and do presentations before the digital stuff, you know, you had physical view graphs you had to print out and somebody put them on a light table. Well, you buy lots of that transparency film and when it, that went out of vogue, there was a lot of transparency film that was getting thrown away and I said, heck yeah, I'll take some of that. So I took it and that's what I use. I, I, I mix my paint on it, I mix my, my um, um, epoxy on it when I'm repairing something. It's, it makes a great, uh, a great thing. I can just cut a corner off, work with it. it. This stuff dries up, I throw it in the trash and move on. But I'm mixing a bright orange here, so I've got some cadmium red, cadmium yellow, and that titanium white, just to lighten it up a little bit. And so I start with the yellow, and I, I mix it in here. I add some, uh, some airbrush medium to it. I take a touch of red, which you can see I, I left white when I did that, or uh, yellow when I did that, and then I mix it in, and I grab some white to lighten it up and left some orange on that. But you know that's the way, that's the way you work when you're, when you're in a hurry to mix these paints up. Now this is what the airbrush medium looks like. I took a, it's just a, a big tall bottle. You open it up and you just drip, 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 like three drops of it into the middle of there. And then you mix it up with your, with your cheapo brush until it's a really watery. You see how much thinner that is now where it, it has actually bubbles in it and things like that. And when you bubbles, you don't want to leave those on your, on your painting when you're, when you're painting. So you have to be kind of careful with that. But yeah, this water consistency stuff will not dry very fast and it will allow you to, to just you know make really nice lines with those pointers and things like that. As I go I'm gonna be painting with that orange and, and every so often it's gonna start getting dry on me so I'm gonna add more airbrush as need medium as needed so that while I'm painting my, my airbrush or my uh, paint stays the same consistency. Now what if I want to use uh, some repeated use amount like that wood tone I was telling you about and some of those other um, you get some blue that's like up here in this corner then when they do a blue screen for a play field they don't just put it all in one place it's like there's some up here there's some around here there's some over there and you want that same color everywhere that's the way it was made so you're going to make a, a disposable cup of that uh, repeated use color and these, these little deals I got from like Sam's they're like a, a Dixie cup and they're made for like salad dressing and single serving you know, little nuts and things like that. And then they have a, a pretty tight fitting lid on them. So they work pretty good. And they're an airtight um, storing for my, for my paint. So when I mix it up, I, I like to keep it in, a, instead of coating the entire bottom of that, that uh, little cup with my paint, I'm gonna mix it up on the edge like that so that I make a nice little puddle here. And the less air I let get to it, the slower it'll wanna dry on me. So I'm gonna tilt it up like that. And then to store it, I'm actually going to take like a little piece of one of those yellow post-its and I'm going to fold it in half and I'm going to stick it to the bottom of the cup and it keeps the cup tipped for me like that over time. And then I put the lid on it and I can come back to like every couple of days depending on how much I've put in here. If I've got a lot of paint in here, I can let it go a couple of days, a couple of three days before I need to add airbrush medium. But if I've got just a little bit, I've got to go in like once every day and I could just keep adding to it. They're, they're so pigment rich, the Liquitex paints, that you can thin them and thin them and thin them and thin them, and it, it just doesn't, doesn't affect it at all. The last time you paint with that will look just like the first time. And then, of course, when you have those mixed paint cups sitting away, you're going to have to maintain working consistency by adding the airbrush medium, like I just said. Painting tips. I like to rest my hand on a piece of acetate, too, as I paint. So I'll take a, a small piece or a large piece, depending upon you know how much how close I am to other touch-ups and things like that. But I'm or how much I'm putting my hand or my arm on the play field. But I want I don't want any of my skin oils touching that play field after I've prepped it, because if I get anything at all on there, I'm going to have orange peel with my clear coat, or I'm going to have adhesion issues with my my acrylic. So I lay it down. I put my hand. I make sure my hand's on top of that. And I've found also it's very handy when I accidentally get my hand over something I just touched up like an hour ago because it's still a little tacky. It doesn't stick to transparency. I can just, it'll stick and you pull it up and it goes and it just comes off and it's not like getting your hand on it. Um, as I, I go, I'm going to keep two rinsing and cleaning cups. So my, my big brush here, I'm going to clean in this dirty bowl here. And if my, my regular paintbrush starts, and it'll start drying over time on my, my fancy brushes, I'll maybe put them in here a little bit just to get some of the worst of the paint off. 
And then I'm always going to have a nice clear one here to final clean my paintbrush with a white, really nice white uh, paper towel to wipe it and pinch the end of it and see if any color comes off onto the paper towel. I know I need to rinse a little more. And after I finish, finish rinsing it, I lick it to point and then I, I set it aside. Or if I'm just cleaning it because it's getting gunky and I need, I need my paintbrush's bristles to start working like they're supposed to again instead of like a, like a toothpick, then I, I'm going to clean them in here and get, get my, my paintbrush back where I need it. Use cheater eyeglasses for t detail work. These are just like a 1.5 mag magnifying glass and as you get older you tell yourself you're just doing that to reduce eye fatigue. It's not like you really need them or anything. <laughs> so, you know, it's just, just, just a little crutch, you know, and you don't need them when you go outside and all that stuff, but yeah. So, um, yeah, they work really good. You, you'll find that there's such like the perfect distance where you get down with your head and everything just gets crystal clear and it's so easy to see the edge of your brush and what's wet and what's dry and all those things. It's, it's great. Remember, acrylic paint is going to darken just a bit. And they explained that in that acrylic book I was talking about, too. They said that the, that the, the extra water and the, and the things that they have in there to keep the polymers from setting up too quickly and drying too quickly, which, you know, is a problem with acrylics, they're like a milky color. And so as they evaporate and those things bond together, the, the milky goes away and your color changes just a little bit and they darken just a little bit. And that's going to be more pronounced with lighter colors, or with darker colors than lighter colors. So yellows and stuff, you're not going to see that much of a difference. But you're mixing a deep blue or black, you're going to, you know, or brown, you're going to see those uh, darken just a hair as, as they dry. So when I test color match, I can also use my acetate if I'm really not even close yet. I, I don't even have to paint onto the play field. I can put my acetate over the top and, and just see if it, it matches when I um, move it over and take a look through the acetate. But you want to do in, a, in an area, if you've got a, if you've got a little chunk missing out of one corner of this triangle, for instance, you want to try and put some of that mixture in the middle of the triangle so that you can see what it looks like surrounded all the way around by the other paint, the, the paint you're trying to match rather than just put it in that corner where you're only getting it up against one edge. You can talk yourself into believing you've got a better match than you really do. So put it in the center, let it dry, and you can just, you know, I'm just talking like blow on it for a few seconds and it's dry enough to tell if you're going to get a good match. If it isn't, you just wipe it off and you're, you, it's really easy to, uh, to, to do it again and give it another try. If you've sanded because you're going to do clear coating, Sometimes that paint gets down into the sandpaper scratches that you've made and you might have to just hit it again just real lightly with a piece of sandpaper to get those, those lines out of there and get back to your true color. To avoid brush strokes, I like to paint in puddles. So I get my paint really thin and then I'll, I'll start, if I'm making a shape, I'll, I'll go around the edge of that shape and make my outer edge look really good and then I've got the whole inner part that I want that same color. Now I just take my paintbrush and I dip it in the paint and I just bring a big old drop and I drop it on there and then I move it around and I move it up against my my and I have much of the wider line that I put already on there as a as a buffer between me and where I don't want to be with it and they just go up against there and it, it flows right into the other line and everything works great and you just keep adding more paint like that it works really good and when if you're done it looks like you've got a little puddle of paint there when that dries it dries perfectly flat and it looks great I'm going to use a flashlight behind inserts, so if, if I need my paint to be opaque as heck when I cover an insert, because it's going to be backlit, it's going to show if it's not done well. So I use a flashlight while I'm painting. I have a flashlight underneath there and I put black over that, and you think, oh, black is black, right? But if I get it too thin, <laughs> I can make it where it's not quite opaque enough. And you can always come back afterwards and check it and, and add another coat if you want to make it more opaque. But I like to try and you know goop it on and get it in good, nice and good and, and opaque the first time, and a, a flashlight helps with that. After painting an area, you can wipe it with a naphtha rag. So I'll take that naphtha and I'll dip it upside down in my in my uh, paper towel, and you let everything dry. You can wash over it with naphtha. It will not take the the acrylic off at all. It doesn't affect it at all unless you're like pushing really hard and you cut it off because you're you're grinding with the paper towel. 
that you can just wash over the area and all of the scratch marks and fuzziness that, that you've added by sanding it goes away and it looks brilliant. You can see exactly what it's going to look like with clear coat on it because that's exactly what the clear coat is going to do to it. It's going to make all those things go away and it really darkens everything. I sometimes uh, take a, a moist toothpick and uh, smooth out edges of a painted area. You know, if I'm going along and I'm making that line to start, and, oh, I got it a little too far out there, I'll let it dry for just a couple of seconds and then come back, lick a toothpick on the end, and then just kind of scrape around the outer edge. And it's a fine line between too wet and too dry. If it's too wet, you'll smear that line. If it's too dry, you'll see it start to kind of crumple. But there's a, there's a working time in there where you can actually go in and just kind of rub some of that off on the edge and make a, a perfectly straight line where you had a little hump back in it just a second ago. Water thin super glue again works good to cover a very small area if you're just like touching up where a ball's kicking out of a scoop and it's made a little chip on your play frill or some some bozo dropped a screwdriver you know now not you of course but some bozo <laughs> dropped a screwdriver on your play field and took a little chunk out you know if you're going to just do a small area like that you can touch it up with and then put a little bit of super glue or a piece of adhesive mylar one time for my mylar it will stick and pull up your your acrylic when you take it off again but now you know how to you know touch up and you're not afraid of that anymore airbrushing tools so it's not cheap to get set up properly, unfortunately. You'll need a decent airbrush. Mine's a, like a hobby quality. It's not anything like you know fancy uh, artists use. But this is what my dual action, and it's called a siphon feed, and it's a Pasha. And so it's a, it, these are made, I guess, in the United States, but some, by some German immigrant, because Pasha is a German word. But these guys make pretty good, uh, I think Badger and Pasha are probably the, two most uh, popular, they used to be anyway, the, the, I may be dating myself, hobby type. And what it has, it has a, a little round circle here, a, a tube here where this, this is a, a, a cup that just goes in there and twists like a, a bit and it just uses a friction because the, you know, it gets a little wider as it goes and it, you sn stick it in until it starts to rub and you turn it and you, then you fill that up with your airbrush uh, medium and, and paint and then you know your mixture whatever you're going to paint and this is uh, the dual action you watch just real closely here you see that how far that button goes down it goes from there to there that's that's how far the first part of the dual action is and that's what allows air to start going through the airbrush and then the next action is all this action from there to there is pulling back I have all of that freedom to decide how much paint I'm going to put in with that air that's going through the, the, the gun at that point so if I barely pull it back it just sprays a real fine mist if I pull it all the way back it's like here it comes you know this is the max paint that I can put out there this is uh, it laying down with my little air hose I have a, a little comfy not hard to drag around air hose that's about four foot long that I use at the very end of it and then I have a a quick disconnect to you know the big type of air hoses I used to air up my tires in my car and things like that and you got to run it at about 40 to 50 psi you got to keep it regulated that's all kind of important too it all comes apart you so you can clean you can take this part off you can unscrew these things pull the pin out of the center and you clean all this stuff whenever you're finished working with it and all the cleaning and the tools for taking it apart and an extra cup are, are all included uh, you're also going to need air compressor, regulator, and hose to get to where you need to paint and all that. So some airbrushing tips just real quickly. Um, use frisket paper or film to mask around an area. So this is like a, it's a very low tack and it's a kind of a see-through film that self-adhesive but it's very low tack. So it's not going to pull up stuff that you put it over. And now you just take that and you lay it down and I laid it perfectly straight along this line right here. So that now if I came and sprayed white right here, it wouldn't get onto this blue. And, but just over this small area where you can see. But you, this comes on like a two or three foot roll. So you can just take a piece and cover the bottom part of your play field if you want to. But it's kind of expensive to do that for everything you mask. So what I did is I cheat and do just like I did right here. Is I'll, I'll cut a strip of frisket paper and I'll use it to mask in between here. And then I'll put paper behind it. So I'll... If I'm going to paint in a little area about this big around, I'll take an eight and a half by 11 sheet of scratch paper and I'll cut a hole in the center of it that big. And now th this piece that I'm going to paint in the center, I'll put this 
this frisket piece of paper right over the top of that and then I'll cut out the area that I'm going to want to paint and that way I don't use that much frisket paper but I use it where it's needed and that's on the edge that I'm painting against. You want to mix plenty of the desired color in a plastic cup because you're going to be using quite a bit of it if you're airbrushing and especially if you've got several large areas you want to mix quite a bit of whatever color you want. You're going to use a, the airbrush medium to thin the paint, keep it to a, like a water consistency and you want to go on slowly. Um, you see people, the same thing with rattle cans, if you, if you start spraying and you think you need to get closer and you need to spray another coat really quickly and you know that's how you get the runs and the, and the terrible look to it. But you want to go in thin so you want to just kind of back and forth thin coats and you can just watch how much paint you can paint. Have a piece of paper, like I said, if I'm working around that edge and I've got an eight and a half by white, uh, by 11 white piece of paper there, I'll just start my airbrush on the paper and then just start moving across when I've got that pulled back to the right um, level to, to allow me to put on a nice thin overlapping coat. I want to feather toward the edge. You don't want to build up paint at the edge of where your frisket paper is or your masking tape or whatever it is you're painting up against. Because when you go to take that off, if it dries, it's going to pull that, make a really ragged edge right at the edge there. So you want to try and feather, and that means take take a little bit of the either pull away or pull, let your uh, dual action go back in a little bit where less paint's coming out as you get towards the edge, and try and feather that in to where you put the thicker stuff out in the middle. And you want to get rid of that frisket mask pretty much immediately after your painting when you're done finished and you're ready to go. Just you know pull it up while the paint's still kind of wet. And that'll make a nice smooth line also. You want to blow clean, clean water through your uh, airbrush several times, fill that little cup up with, and you would bring a, a one that doesn't have anything but clear water in it and run that through a few times. And you want to clean your airbrush ASAP, maybe even sooner. Uh, I mean, you want to get it clean and you, you don't want to be admiring your work while your paint's messing up your airbrush and it will dry in there and make a mess. So it's easier to clean nice warm water, the sooner the better. So repainting playfield toys. This is kind of some of the pinball stuff that I've done. This I actually, this is a space shuttle, actual toy off my space shuttle game. It was, um, it had decals that were coming off, but if you look at the decals, they were in de pretty decent shape. And so they're made of a really good quality vinyl material. None of them were torn or messed up or gouged or you know, ripping or anything like that. So I was actually able to pull those off and use a 3M467MP um, clear adhesive. It's a double-sided adhesive kind of stuff. To, to, I, I took naphtha and I cleaned the back of these. See how it's black there? That's the adhesive that's gotten all this black soot from, from the play field. And you could turn that over and you could, you could hit it with naphtha and, and clean the old adhesive off and you had a nice flat vinyl decal again, ready to go. So I put uh, 467 MP, stuck it on there, cut a piece to, to fit, and then you just, when you're ready to put it back on, you just peel the backing off of that and you've got the new adhesive. Crystal clear, very permanent, really good uh, adhesive, 467 MP by 3M. And I was able to put all my decals back on once I painted my shuttle. And what I did to paint the shuttle was I used a, a white uh, Krylon plastic paint. They, they've made a plastic paint there that supposedly bonds with plastic. And I got an ivory color. It's just, you know, you, that shows how yellow the old one was. That, that, that's not really bright white. It's ivory. And I painted the shuttle. I painted the, the tip black and the, and the very, very tip gray. And then I just reinstalled the stickers. Same things. Same stickers as, as what were on there originally. And they stuck even better than they did the first time, I'll bet. So... I wanted to, I thought my Dracula was messed up. You know, I, he had f f flat feet at the bottom. And so I thought, you know, surely somebody's broke the feet off my Dracula over the years, so I'm going to get a new one. So I went online and found one and shelled out 40 bucks, and in comes this guy. And I'm like, holy cow, the guy looks like he's been eating tomato soup like my daughter when she was three years old. <laughs> Look at the, who painted this? A blind four-year-old? This is terrible. I did, and I started applying my, uh, my one rule of pinball. Can you make it look better? I think I can. I think I can make that look better. So this is what I did. 
And then when I started painting him, I started noticing things. I'm like, hey, he's got other details in here that they just didn't paint. He's got a bow tie. I think, I think a bow tie looked better black. He's got a button on his vest. Look at that. And the, no, that's where he spilled some of his tomato soup. That's not really him. <laughs> And he's got buttons on his vest. Look at that. They, none of this detail that they, they molded in did they use. You know, they tried to clumsily do his ring, and I did that a lot better. They did this little brooch in the middle, and they, so I did that better too. And then I used that, that crimson red, which is, already has a, a bit of uh, translucency to it, right? So it's, it, you can see the other color through it, but when you put it over the top of the existing red, it looked really cool. So that's what I did for Dracula, and I repainted him, and I thought, here's a good chance to try some detail work. <laughs> and yeah, and then try it again, and then, <laughs> and then try it one more time. <laughs> that's the way it works, you know, you start in with that, and you say, oh, I'll just leave the white behind, and next thing you know, you're touching up the red, because it got, you know, you got white on the red, and then you're, you get red on the white again, you got to touch up the white again, and it, it just goes back and back. Back and back and forth, but you know, I even put a little speck of white on these so it shows like it's sparkling, kind of cool. This guy, I he's molded in purple from the waist down, so his his boots were purple. His he has a, a rope going across, holding his pants up, and a blue patch here that 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 were all purple. Then none of they didn't paint any of that from the factory. And then his he's molded in the flesh color from above, and they really wickedly sprayed on all the silver and they got it all over spray all the way down him. I mean, it looked like a more like a silver rope than it did a chain. So I, being a meticulous perfectionist that I am, got down here with my X-Acto knife and scraped off all the silver, the extra silver paint, and then came and got some other silver acrylic paint from, uh, from like just a, uh, stuff that they sell at Hobby Lobby and I repainted some of the areas here and cleaned up the other areas, added a blue patch, made his boots brown, gave him a yellow, and even gave him a little gold earring. It's hard to see there, but yeah. <laughs> Frankenstein, yeah, once you start, you just can't stop, you know, and then Frankenstein doesn't look good, and his feet get bashed, so his, you know, they were, they did paint those black from the factory, but the paint all got knocked off, and I, this is a, this was a good durability test for, for acrylic paint. You, you paint that, and you let it set up, and and, and get good and strong, and you put it in there. I didn't have to, I don't think I've ever repainted his boots, and they're still pretty black. The bride I did a lot less with. I, I painted a white where her skin was showing, and just left this ivory thing that she had. I painted black around the bottom so it would it define where her feet were and things, like she was standing on something black. And the head was really bad, so I, I got in close there and, and redid the hair and, and made that bright pink color using that same acra red with some white and then the guy here i added a bunch of buttons and they gave him a gray shirt and and some black pins in his pocket and then touched up his flesh i didn't actually repaint all his flesh i touched i matched the color and fixed a little bit around here a little there a little on his face i was working on my buddy's elvis machine and Elvis has this, this machine, this guy comes up dancing in the middle of the play field and he brings his microphone up and he's got a hand back doing this and his, if his arm gets loose he hits himself in the chin with his microphone <laughs> and he gets, up, he gets a black goatee and so he, I'm like, I'm looking at that like Eric, Elvis didn't have no black goatee, we, we ain't going there and so I got some paint out and matched the color of the flesh tone and, touched up his cheek and then put a new screw in his arm because the one that they used, I don't think they even screwed it back in, they just glued it and it was really bad. He was bashing himself in the face <laughs> with that thing. But yeah, you can find the best places to touch things up. Other pinball touch-up opportunities. The black areas on the outside and inside of your cabinet. This is a corner down by the, the speaker panel on a twilight zone. And there's always these scratches and scrapes and things where this are coming apart and chunks that they took out. Incidentally, if you don't like that wood grain of looking at the edge of a piece of plywood, that's the best you can paint at the edge of a piece of plywood if you don't do anything to it. And you know, good on them for getting it that black. But you know, if you don't mind that, you just come in here with some Mars black, right? And you don't even have to thin this stuff. You just you can put it in there and just, and I, I hit it with one of those cheapo paint brushes and I just wipe the excess off with my fingers and the stuff stays down in the cracks in it. That stuff, black Mars, 
identical to the black that they use in this. Same sort of uh, um, gloss to it and everything. If you want to fill those in and have the front of your cabinet and your or front of your back box look better, you can take um, putty. Um, they, it's a spot glazing putty, and they, you can buy it at an auto parts store. It comes in a tube, and it's it's like it's like a really thin red um, powdery substance. It, it's 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 watery, but it's got red powder in it. You can see it because that's what's going to be left behind when you finish with it. But you can just take that, and you can take a, a, a putty knife, and you can put some spot glazing putty on it and just rub down there and you'll see the red stay in all the different cracks and on you may have to do it two or three times because some of these can be very deep and if some of them are really bad got chunks of things you can use bondo to start and then come back with the spot glazing putty and then paint that and it'll be just like glass on, across the front of that and it looks really good i did it on my monster bash inside the cabinet places where people have scraped and cut and you've got these big you know if, if it's bad enough and, and they've rubbed areas and things like that yeah, you want to you wanna just kind of take some black satin cry on and just come in there and redo both sides. But if you've just got little places that need to be fixed up and little chunks out here and there, black, Mars Black does a really good job of that too. Paint it over there and rub it with your finger. Makes your fingers black, but it's, it, it's water-based <laughs> paint. You can wipe it off. It's not a big deal. But you do want to clean it first. You want to make sure you clean this. And you've, if you've ever cleaned the side, insides of your cabinet, you know that as soon as you go over that with a paper towel or any type of rag, you get in all kinds of lint gets caught in the wood, especially if you go against the grain. What happens there to, to clean that up, you can take a toothbrush and you can go back and just brush it with a toothbrush and you can get that lint out after you've cleaned it. And then you can paint it and then you're all good to go. Playfield artwork borders. So, in the Incredible Hulk pinball machine back in the day from uh, Gottlieb, it had two pieces up here that framed the top of the play field and made the, basically the orbit, you know, the metal bar that they used the ball to run against is covered. And they, they didn't light it in this game. They just put these metal pieces in there. So they're not translucent at all. But it seemed to be for an operator somewhere, a buddy of mine got a machine and he had a really... He had a dead, a completely dead one. I, I brought it all back to life. I do electronics work and all that too. But you know, you have problems like this where these guys took and put those damn stickers that tell you you're legal to operate this game in whatever state in the union that requires those. And then you decide to take them off and you take them off with a razor blade. That's what happens. Razor blade chips that stuff out. So what I did is finish taking the stickers off, and this is what I was left with on both sides. And you can see even here where that, uh, that little ball gate is mounted right there. That's, you know, the light has changed the color of Hulk from the light color he used to be to this darker. So you, you can see what the old color looked like there. So I've taken the leg off your cabinet, and you can see underneath. But, so I, I came in, and I, again, sit there, and I look at this, and I'm like, well, this ain't going to work. The, that looks t whoops I'd say that looks terrible you know I, I, I that's not gonna work for me and that's right there and the player sees it while he's playing and all that and I'm like can I make that look better I think so so this is what I did so I, I had to mix purple because some of the purple stuff was obviously screwed up you know some of it just completely gone I had to mix green and I had to do black but I think I did all right. And it looks really good, and he was very happy with it. Spinners on that same game, they just, you know, these were like hot stamped in the day, and they, they did a, a process where they stamped them, and then they, and they had paint on the, at the same time, so it would melt in, and it would leave the paint behind. And they just didn't look very good, and I thought I could do better, so I did. So from that, and especially you can see it over here in the wood, and the black on this guy. And then back on the play field. Did you have to do any clear coating on those nope. after you were done? No, they, these are pretty, these weren't, weren't uh, beat up by the ball. They were just beat up by Father Time. I mean, th these are nice. The, the Gottlieb, the old Gottlieb, some of their ideas are like harebrained. You're like, what in the hell were they thinking? Sometimes you look at it and you're like, that's not too bad. Because this, this actually had a, a convex face to it. So the lip at the bottom here is what the ball hits all the time. And so it spins around, doesn't, 
doesn't have a flat face like a Williams or a Valley target that gets bashed all the heck on the bottom there. So it, it act, they actually work pretty good in the game. They look good. Screen play field plastics. You can fix most of the damage to screened artwork, and it looks pretty good. They, the, it's not quite as translucent as like back glasses and trans lights. Cause they put a white backing on it to protect it, and it makes it less translucent, so it matches more with the, with the acrylic paint. Um, a lot of times you'll have intent, the screw heads of a post that isn't fastened through your plastic. It's underneath. It sits on. It's supposed to sit above it. A lot of times they get the, the posts are different length and they get them where they, they actually start to rub on those and they rub the paint off the back and that, those are very annoying. So I, I fix those kind of things and when I'm done, I put a piece of, uh, small piece of uh, clear mylar on the back of it to protect them from it ever happening again. Um, where I work with CGC now, where we, on our games, we look at those places and make the posts and add spacers and things to, so that they don't rub on there. It's, it's just very annoying when that happens. You take a plastic off two or three times and you, you've got all these holes in your artwork. Back glasses, trans lights are just inherently difficult. They're, the translucency is, a, is the key there. It's just difficult to match. You can, if you get the color right, even if you get the translucency right, if you overlap it all to existing artwork, you've got to just paint what's missing, just in that hole right there. You get overlapping a little bit, then it looks thicker and it looks darker and it calls attention to your irregularities and, and, and mistakes. But, you know, sometimes the backlighting draws even more attention because the light's shining right through there just really grabs your eye. So does it look better than it did before? Sometimes it does, and it's worth doing. I've done that many times. So, my playfield uh, projects. Back to that high speed guy. This was what I started with. And I had a huge chunk down in here. I had chips missing up in here. I had chips missing over here. I had a, one of those places on the side here where they, all the paint was gone off of this, all the way into this car down here, and the police car chasing him. There was ramps, you know, where entrances to the ramps were damaged. Uh, just, you know, nasty saucers and things like that problems. And this is, uh, this is what my high speed playfield looked like when I got done. So I got pictures online of this area to see what that bush is supposed to look like because not much of it was there once. This is dirty again. There's the, there's the cleaning phase, there's the scrubbing and sanding phase, and then you start the painting and you lose even more of this paint. Than, than is there in the dirt, dirty pictures. So I'm going to show you how that works in some of these in a, in a minute here. But yeah, I, I got pictures and I matched the green, the dark green, the light green that's uh, inside the bush, and then the white that goes on top of it. And this was the first play field I'd ever done, and I just didn't take the time to do anything that wasn't going to show. So all the plastics and place, post chunks and pieces that were missing, I thought, eh, the post is going to cover that up. I, I don't really care about that. And, and I also was thinking, you know, these kind of things are kind of cool. There's not very many games that have the, the size of the rubber rings shown in the, in the artwork underneath. I thought that was kind of a cool thing. And if I were to paint over that, I'd, I'd mess that up. So, so I started in with circles here. You know, those were extremely difficult to do. Circles are no fun. And this stuff was pretty, you know, free handy sort of. You can go back when you've got a big chunk of wood like that. You can go back and you can take, after you get it all clean, you can take a pencil and you can kind of draw the way you want that to look and then start filling it in. And that, that's kind of what I did there. And uh, this brown, uh, this, this brown, I gave it away already, this gray was not easy to match. You see, I fixed the, the inserts here. I fixed the little car and made him look just like he does in other pictures that I've seen. Very fine detail work on both these guys. And I'm trying to match this, this damn gray here, and I can't get it. It's like, what in the heck has this gray got in it? A little bit of brown, and bam, I nailed it. It was, it was I didn't even paint all of these. I just painted the areas where it was messed up, and it, it, was, it was perfect. Is that mostly brushwork then? Or have yeah, you that is all brushwork. Oh, I was okay. scared to death of Mr. Airbrush at that point. <laughs> I, I really didn't know. I had it. I had played with it and made some t-shirts with acrylic paints and things like that. But man, trying to do fine work with it, I was like, ah, oh, man, I was afraid I'd have a tiger by the tail. I was, I was afraid to death of it. So, now would you have done airbrush? What's that? Would you do any airbrush? 
Yes, I would do, would have done it. Now I'm going to show you. I, I did airbrushing within the next couple of years after this, but you know that intestinal fortitude thing. It wasn't. You know, I say I have no no problems with confidence. I, a little bit of problems with confidence in Mr. Okay. Airbrush, but yeah, yeah I, I actually bought a a, br a very wide flat brush that I used to paint the 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 road here and places and chunks like that. So I could just drag it and it it would the air the little uh, brush strokes would go over time and, and flatten out as the paint dried. It worked out really well. I had a big problem in my left in uh, in and out lane. There was chunks and numbers missing and all. Oh, if circles suck, boy, lettering really sucks. <laughs> and if lettering really sucks, this dithering and you know half tone stuff with these dots is just maddening. But you got to do the best you can, and so this is what I did. You know, I ended up putting all these little dots back in, <laughs> and some of it I was guy, you know, this looks pretty good, I think. But you know, and I struggle. I don't know how many times I repainted, kicked back one lit, and zeros over here, and rubbed them off, and started again. It was it was very difficult, but I I, I was very determined to, to get this done. Uh, and then the reds and the things I thought it turned out pretty well. And that's after clear coating. So this is all under clear coat now. Uh, I did a bunch of different areas on that, but I'm gonna save the, the one that, that's most impressive for last year. And the one that I documented best, quite frankly, because when I first did it, I was like, you know, I'm not sure I wanna know what it looked like before. <laughs> I might violate that rule. Did I make it? It looks good now. I, I forgot how good it looked before, but you know, before I started messing with it. I got an F14 from for a friend of mine and, and he was, he was very excited about it. I told him, you know, I, I, I think I, we can touch up this play field and make it look a lot better. F-14 is a mylar, mylar nightmare. It's an insert nightmare. They have mylar everywhere. This is, this is a piece of mylar that comes up this way, goes that way, goes that way, goes around that, comes down here. You know, it, and it, we just started peeling that off, and it, and it actually came off pretty well without taking too much artwork with it. You can see it was already coming off of this one because that insert was raising, and what happens is then it, it, it lifts the mylar and makes this big uh, lip right there that was physically catching the ball. So you had to cut it down to keep the ball rolling back down there when it made it halfway up that, that side over there. The big problem here, and this is where this yellow light isn't helping me here with the projector, but this was a nice, really pretty blue. This is, they made a mylar piece that went up in the, around the pop bumper up there um, at the top, came around it like that. Then above it, they made this, and why they didn't just make two that fit, you know, you, you look at that and you're like, man, wouldn't it have been better if you just covered the whole thing with mylar? But, you know, you want to make it where it's individual pieces that can be aligned and hand applied and all that and not start at one end and have to do like you do with a cabinet decal and get all the way to the other end, keeping it aligned. So they put little pieces in there. And what that led to was a place, place of wear here and a place that got really nasty and dirty. So it got all blackened in here. And when we pulled these off, these were like a pristine um, sky blue color. So what I did, and I did not repaint this whole thing. This is all brush work again. I went in and I brushed. You can faintly see the, the, the brush marks there, but the color match was really good. So that when we clear coated, it was, it's basically gone. And that, that, that worked really well. So getting in and all this dirt and everything around there, and you know, this, this was not airbrushing again. You can see where I did you know, put red in where there were flakes and black. You can see some of it because of the sunlight in the areas that I touched up with blacks and, and things like that. There was covering cracks and planking that was going on in the play field. And it, it worked pretty good. Another area was on the left side over here. These inserts again, they, they had a piece of mylar that just abruptly stopped right there. So we had problems with the, the um, you know, pulling up some of the black around these weird inserts. We had to tap those back down to get them flat again and then super glue them into place so they stayed that way. And the way you do that is use a heat gun above and below. So you heat them up really good from above, you heat them up really good from below and you soften that. Um, it's kind of a, a, a rubbery type glue that they used to put them in originally. And once you've got it to where you feel, you can feel it push in, then you tap them gently and get them flat. And while they're still warm, super glue all the way around the inside of it so it keeps them that way they don't pop back up again so that i started there 
and I, you can see all the touch up I did in here because of the, the this is the, the gray that you get when you sand. You, you rough up the play field and get it ready for clear coat. Then when you put black in there, it really shows. But like I say, you take a piece of uh, naphtha and run across that and you can see that everything just turned rich black when you did that, so I knew I was good. And then we clear coat it and you can't tell any of that anymore. This is down low. He had some problems with some of his inserts here. They were lifting and, and so bad that the ball chipped off the Alpha and the Bravo and parts of the, the tops of those. Again, Mylar up in the center that we had to remove. Mylar in this area that they used to cover this stuff and try and protect it. Of course, they didn't go far enough out because these two stuck out and, and, and got chipped off. You can see the edge of the Mylar there, how it came up this way. So I touched it up and it's really obvious where I touched it up there. You can see the stuff again in the inlays where I'm covering planking and things like that up. And then we clear coat it. And it all gets very uniform. Fun house. Now this one's here. This is where me and Mr. Airbrush made up. So we figured out how to work that. I, I had such broad areas in this play field. I, I bought this play field used. And I bought it looking at it, knowing that this area right here, from, from the top of the clock up into this area, was going to be the extremely difficult to touch up. If, I need, if there were any bad problems in that area, I didn't want that play field, because that's orange dots on top of red, or orange underneath with red dots on top of it, whichever one. But it gradates from you know, very thin down here, where it's almost orange, and, until it got into the deep red up here. So this one met those, that criteria. That was a one area of the play field that scared the bejesus out of me. So I stayed away from that. Everything else, all the rest of this, I thought was workable. There is one more area up here, actually, where it goes orange into, into yellow that, that does the same thing. But uh, it's only like a half inch wide, and it's actually hidden under plastics <coughs> and stuff. So I wasn't too afraid of that. This is right out in the open. And the, interestingly, when I looked at the, the play field here, I'm like, they messed up their yellow screen here because... These, this yellow highlight that they put on all of these other balloons, they did not put on the, the orange one. It's white around there, so that should have been yellow. The yellow screen, they forgot to cut it for that. So I, being the perfectionist I am, I'm going to fix that. I added you know, yellow right in that spot because I knew it needed there. Problem is, I missed the really obvious one right in front of me, the mustard right here. So we got to assume that that's either whipped cream or mayonnaise, I guess, because I didn't fix that one. And to, I get it clear-coated, and I'm like, there's another place that we probably should have used yellow. Dang it. Another chance to make my fun house truly unique. Big problems down here around the pop bumpers, big problems around these round inserts. All the paint's gone on the top. This, this was a mess over here, and I had to do some quick wood repairs here. I had quick wood around some of these uh, target holes here, the, uh, the whole... Up over here had some quick wood, I think, and then, and then there was a hole up in this area that also um, I put quick wood in. And my paint's coming off of my step inserts. The S had looked really bad, so I was going to have to recreate that, but eh, nothing I couldn't handle. So that's what I did. So I, I, you can see when I, I airbrushed this area, I used that... Uh, I, I made, I basically kind of made my own red here. I, I decided that I, I wanted it, and, and, and in my defense, I had seen several Funhouse play fields. They were made at like four or five different manufacturers, and they didn't use the exact same colors all the time. So the, there were some Funhouse play fields that have more of an orange red top to them, and then there's some that have a scarlet red. I like the scarlet red, so I kind of brought that out in mind. So you can see from the, from the, um, the before here, that it's it's almost more of that orangish red, and when I'm done, it's much more scarlet. I fixed the yellow on here. I put yellow around that. Forgot that one. Made it nice and white, bright white. But I, I painted all the white because this this white was just terrible, you know, under underneath whoops, underneath the uh, the slings and stuff. That the, the, that's not the yellow of the projector showing that. That's really what color that stuff was, and the the bright white just made it so much nicer. Touched up all of little uh, uh, Rudy sliding down here and, and all these things. These were these were major bear. Like I said, circles are not fun. And yeah, it came out it came out really nice. And the oranges and all that, the green. Let me show some more of this one here. 
So down in my left out lane, oh, big problem, because all of the insert artwork was gone. And those are words, and words, remember, they suck. It's not easy to do. So, you know, I got big problems with the pop bumper area here and on down into the, where the tickets and things here. So this, this more circles in here, oh my God, they're everywhere. And this is what I did. So I was able to cre recreate the word special in there from nothing and then hand lettered right left light uh, right gangway these are not decals this is and then the steps open by hand yes with me me and my little bitty Simmons brush and several tries I think it turned out damn good did you write anything on there and then go over with the paint? no no How I mean did it take you to do a play to a this this play field took me oh, probably about three or four months of quite a bit of work. Like like Andy said, he wasn't he wasn't BSing you. This it's a lot of meticulous work and people that try and do this and get paid for it, I re learned early on I wasn't ever going to do that. I mean, I, one guy bought, paid me to do a play field one time and and it, that was all I took on and I told him it was going to take a long time and I you know, I'm very slow at it. And he was happy with that. He wanted a play field that I had done. So, yeah, I did it. But, and that was a no-good gophers. And it didn't require a heck of a lot. And I knew how to airbrush at that point. So I was able to airbrush a lot of the stuff. But I think this, this stuff turned out really well in here. It looked, looked very good. The steps open was hard to do, too. This, uh, I don't know what happened here. But the, the, this is part of that multi-screen thing where they put a wide in behind this green. And then they put the green over the top of it and the green didn't take there was something on the play field or something that kept the green from taking right and didn't didn't adhere properly so we um, we painted it green and fixed the lettering up there by this time I'm getting pretty good at, at lettering and, and fixing those so that, that turned out really nice and yes I actually put a white dollop of paint on every single <laughs> one of those because that's the kind of guy I am yeah, and yeah, it's, it, it, it got to where it was just really satisfying. I had some problems with my clock here, the inserts. The, this was not a, a Mylar game, so it had taken a lot of wear from the, from the ball in this center area. Maybe it was. Maybe that's, it, it was a Mylar area. You can see it here. The, some of these were Mylar, and this is the play field where Lawler was trying to, to convince Williams that they needed the diamond coat. Yeah. And you do use diamond plate. So some of them they wouldn't, and some of them they did, and some of them they mylar, and some of them they left alone so they could kind of compare them all. And then, like I said, they were being made by multiple manufacturers. But when I pulled the mylar off, I think it's what happened here. These, these bottom inserts and some of these got, got pretty messed up. So I repainted all those and fixed those all up. I masked all the white in this area and airbrushed that. So I cut mask all around this blue dot stuff and left the blue dot original and all around the inserts and I mask and, and sprayed that whole area at one time with white. And it came out really nice. My space shuttle, this is my pride and joy and this is the last one I'll show you. This, this game, uh, I even wanted to show you what it said on eBay when I bought this game. I paid $400 for it. I drove to New Oklahoma City to get it. I'm going to read this to you. This auction features a 1984 Williams Space Shuttle pinball machine. This machine is a USA model, not a re-import, and was operated for most of its life sick at Crystal's Sick Again Pizza Parlor <laughs> and subsequently at convenience stores. Oh my God, what are convenience stores? Big windows with lots of sunlight coming in. This machine is unshopped and in the same condition it was taken out of the convenience store. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> the game plays the game of pinball, but could definitely use a good old-fashioned shop job. With, <laughs> yeah, to make it sparkle, play faster, and best of all, raise its sick value. I'm not talking your typical shop job. I'm talking a serious shop job with lots of touch-up, elbow grease, and sweat. Can you, can you see this? this, this he's calling. He's talking to me. He's you calling know. me. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's like the left side of the machine is in pretty sad shape. It will need a lot of touch-up, if not a complete sand down and paint job. Yes, it needed a complete sand down and paint job. It needed that, uh, that's where you learned the spot glazing putty thing. It was so bad. 
The playfield has plenty of worn spots shown in the playfield pictures below. Not the worst out there, but certainly not home use only. The legs are flaking of chrome, off chrome, I think he meant to say, and will need to be replaced if you want nice and shiny legs. Legs included hold the machine up just fine, so they don't have to be replaced immediately. And the plastic quarter signs on the front are broken. There's no key to that back glass head, but it's unlocked, so you can get in there. That's good. One saving grace is the fantastic back glass. And he was right, the back glass was in fantastic condition. This machine is actually in overall pretty good working condition. I played several games and didn't find any mechanical problems other than one switch that didn't register. Switch that didn't register is a drop target from the spatial entrance. It'll reset properly and drop, but it doesn't count as hit. The, oh, by the way, it resets because it's hit, so it doesn't work properly. <laughs> the player two and three displays don't light up, but other than that, it works pretty good. You know, I'm pretty certain the game, the problem is not with the display. Don't, don't bother writing that in there, buddy, because it was the display. They were bad. But something upstream. Since player one and four displays are actually very nice. You see an out-of-order sign taped to the back glass in this overexposed picture, but I'm not really sure why it's on there. I mean, so I dropped a quarter in the machine. It fired right up, ready to play. I'm guessing it was placed there because player two and three displays were out. I didn't remove the sign. I tried, but, and I'll just, you know, interpret for the rest of this because he says it's very dried out masking tape because it would have taken more than 30 seconds to do. That's why he didn't do it. Get a razor blade, a single edge razor blade. It comes right off. Uh, whoops, there's no lock for the, the front door, but they're easy to get and easy to install. What you can is include is four legs, eight bolts, one coin mechanism, and four balls. You even get an extra ball. It's only three needed for the game. <laughs> Everything you need to fire it up and play. When I say this machine could use a good old-fashioned shop job, I'm not kidding. This sucker is dirty, all capital letters. It's the one could set up the machine, plug it in, play, 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 and the other joy of owning a pinball machine is the normal upkeep. You'll either shop it now or shop it later, even if you buy a new one. Just remember, many sellers will wipe down Playfield and replace the easy to reach bulbs and call machine shop. In other words, if you want something done right, do it yourself. Again, he's talking to me. If you read nothing else, read this. This machine is dirty. It is well worn. It needs your tender loving care in a big way. It works, it plays, it keeps score for player one and four anyway. But it is in no way a plug and play and forget machine. I've told, been told that I would be better off selling the parts, i.e. make more money but I just can't do it because I know there are people out there willing to tackle this project and end up with a very nice machine. He is he's talking to me. He's talking to me. The back glass is mint. Say no more. I'm, I'm sold. Where, where do I buy? Cabinets easy to stencil and paint. That's a lie. The, <laughs> the play field will need a careful hand for touch-up. That's true. No spatial unique parts that are impossible to find or necessary. Sort of. But for the most part, he was true. Just a time, desire, and a bit of talent. Okay, I check, check, and check. I think I got those. So this machine will plug in the wall and start playing pinball till the cows come home. <laughs> you better hope the cows are already on their way home. That's all I could say, because that, that machine was ready to fall apart. You're ready to tear it down for a few hours and really spit shine it. It'll clean up and play even better. So here's the back box. Left side of the back box when I got it after I re-stenciled it and painted it myself. I made my own stencils and made, you know, traced over the original artwork and, and cut out stencils out of acetate, laid them on top, used rattle cans I painted with blue Krylon and red and white Krylon. I used masking tape to do the lines around the, the outside here and I used my stencils to do the, the white and the, on top of the blue. And I meticulously you know, sanded everything flat. Use filled in all the cracks and crevices and everything with Bondo and, and that spot glazing putty before I primed it and then painted it and then added the stenciling. So that's what my back glass looked like afterwards, or my back box. Inside, yeah, pretty nasty. Uh, the boards are all there, that's a good sign. No acid or a battery alkaline leaking, that's good too. And this is after, I took this out and basically shined it with like, uh, um, polish, metal polish, and you could, it was like one of the metal things in the bathroom and you could comb your hair, you know, and you could see it, they put them in, people break the mirrors. <laughs> I repainted, I took all this stuff off and, and put uh, polyurethane on that, cleared it all up so it came out really nice. Even the top of the game oh. took care of it all. This is the front again, I was telling you guys about how you can fix that stuff there. That's how it looks when you get it fixed. I took the speaker bar out there. I 
you know, really polished the metal parts on it. I took new uh, black material uh, felt and put it over the speaker panel. I redid the insert door, got rid of the two displays that didn't work because they were dead. And yeah, that's what it looks like now. Now the cabinet. So in this project, and this how long, I know how long this one took me because I, this was my first big, big re restore program and I spent a year on the cabinet, a year on the play field. <laughs> and I did the cabinet first because the play field scared the hell out of me again. But, oh, there's that left side that is a pretty sad shape. You can see that through the window of the Circle K, can't you? Yeah. Oh my gosh. And this, this, if you ran your hand along there, you got blue flecks of white flecks of old paint, and and it, and and you could get a, a really bad splinter because it was just rough as could be here. I mean, you could use that as sandpaper. It was so bad, and so I I fixed all that up, re stenciled everything. I mean, made it to where I could look down with a really bright light, look down the length of it, and I couldn't see an imperfection at all in it anymore. Other side of the game, this is the quote-unquote good side that didn't need touch-up or he didn't even mention at all. Uh, yeah, it was pretty bad too. Again, all that moving stuff where they tear them up and they hit on things. Fix that all up too. Oh, the front. He, he neglected to mention they had one of them security bars across here with an eye bolt that somebody pulled three-fourths of the way through the front of the cabinet trying to get at them quarters behind there. Oh my God, this was just ripped to, to death and this, I had to bondo it inside and out because it just caved that whole part of the, the wood there. And this is the one piece that I went out, I got a new coin door, or a used coin door off of eBay because this one had been beat in a couple of places and I just, I'm not good at flattening that stuff. I, I pounded on it before and the more you pound on it, the worse it looks. So I went and got a new coin door. Or, a new used coin door that at least had that piece in good shape and traded it out. Nice. Turned out really good. The coin door itself, you know, bent necks and things. And I fixed all that up. I made my own decal for this guy to show when the button's down. You couldn't buy those back then. This was probably 06, something like that. So the reproduction stuff, and somebody should have told this guy, you, you are allowed to clean this nasty block <laughs> bar receiver channel. You, you can do that. Just clean it a little bit. I was, oh my gosh, it was terrible. That's, that's a combination of uh, the green scouring pads, the 3M, um, what do they call those? Things? I call them scrungies. Scotch Bright. Yes, okay. that's the one. I call them scrungies. But, yeah, <laughs> but those things work pretty good. And then even those, they, they, um, you go back in on some of this stuff that's really rusted into it. I think I sanded that also. I used a really, started with a, like a 100 grit sandpaper, went to like a 250 or 400, and then used the green scotch Bright as the final, to, just to make it really just smooth as can be. I even polished the little uh, brass. Steel wool? No, I haven't. I, what I don't like about steel wool is it is it separates into little um, pieces that end up with points that stick into your fingers. I've had a you know I've been working on a piece and had it stab me in the hand and that that really hurts. So you know I've never had that happen with a scrunchie. It, it, it works until it's no good anymore. I throw it in the trash. I start with another one, and uh, yeah, you you use a really brand new one and you get that nice finish on there like that you can just and you you don't sand it a little bit you know like work over here and then work over here you can start that way if you're getting the worst of it out but then when you're starting to put the final um, marks on it you want to go from end to end with your sandpaper and your and your scotch bright pad works really good even the underside they tried they couldn't get the front of the cabinet to cave they tried from under here and they pried on this and they broke the edge of the plywood off. Would you know that I went and made little chip, little strips of plywood and took the chips off of those and, and glued them back on and reformed all that? Oh my gosh. And put the metal back in. I polished the metal. I polyurethane the bottom. I went crazy on this machine. And I wouldn't take a million bucks for it. And there's even the back when I got done. 
and it's gorgeous. It still sits in my shop. It's playable. You turn it on, it's fun. Oh, now the gold. Did play you field. clean the legs, or you just? I got new legs too. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 by high speed, I, I took the rust off of them. It kind of came back over time. I live in the desert, so rust is not a big problem. When, when I bring something to my shop that's rusted, it didn't rust anywhere around my shop. That, that's from somewhere else. But So yeah, the, the legs I cheated on too. I, I forgot to mention that. The coin door and the legs. I'm uh, guilty as charged. You caught me. <laughs> now the play field. I'm just going to show several different areas and I'll show you the entire play field. This is like uh, the pop bumper areas. The pop bumpers are up in this area and these little astronaut dudes are coming down underneath. So this is what it looks like, you know, when I first took my before, my as it arrived to me pictures. And you can see how much dirt is on the play field. When you go to clean it then and scrub it, that's when you start losing some more paint here and you, and you take the mylar circles off around there and you start to see, you know, the real damage that's gonna need to be fixed. And you see even the, the, this hasn't been sanded yet either. This is cleaned and scrubbed. And then I did the sanding and then started doing, so as I, as I go through my touch-ups here, you'll see that I've sanded it since then. And it starts looking more dull in the background. And this is the, uh, I, I took uh, the, the first step here is, is red, I think, red and blue. I think the first one was, yeah, the first one was, um, cleaned and scrubbed. This one's bringing in the light blue and red. This one's doing some orange down here. And you see how you paint too much? You paint more than you need on these areas so that when you come back with white across here, I can paint over the top of the orange. And I know white is very opaque and it can handle that. And so I paint my orange a little over. So I'm not trying to meet paint edge with paint edge. I'm going to overlap a little bit. So that makes it easier to, to complete. And this is after yeah. all the touch-ups. And you see, if you look up in the pop bumper skirt, you know, you see these little chunks that were missing and stuff. You can see those pretty clearly still. When I've, after I've painted and put the grays in here and everything, and I'm just not too worried about that because after the clear coating, they go away. And everything becomes just glass smooth. Black is always your last color. So here I started out with the, the heat shield, which is that post that pops up in the center and and some of the immediate artwork in that area, namely these letters. See how many letters are on there now? It, it doesn't look all that bad, right? And when I start cleaning it though and, and scrubbing it, oh man, a lot of that goes away. But if I've got little, it's like painting connecting dots. You know, if I've got parts of letters, it sure is a lot easier to finish letters than it is if there's nothing there at all. And then as I start to add some gray, I add a little light gray here and you see the the light gray and the dark gray down in this area. Little chunks and, and all were taken out. I put some red in there. Now I add some orange. So you've got orange, red, light gray, black, uh, dark gray. And again, I'm, I'm making my orange not worry too much about the shape being perfect and not too much about the shape being perfect on the red. That, that's black's problem. Okay, so I'm gonna get that later. A lot of blue here. This, is, this was not before I did the uh, airbrushing, so this was going to be all brush to fix all this stuff and the planking and all the issues that I had here. And there's after the all the touch-ups. So I matched the blue and I did the the white around here, all the black. Now now it's important that these be look as, as just as good as I can make them. And how did you airbrush around all the letters? How how did I what? When you airbrush the the letters. I don't airbrush the letters. Those are all well, painted around the my edges, hand. Then you paint around the edges? Yes. Oh, okay. Like okay. You, you know, I make up extra in one of those cups and I save it for a long time. I airbrushed all around it roughly oh. and then I can come back and touch with the, the paintbrush in between. Um, so I want to put the blue on and then I want to put the white on top of the blue as the last thing. But every once in a while, you know, something, something looks a little goofy here and you actually get a little white off in this area, you can still come back with your blue and, and, and make that last line there and, and still make it look good so mm. I thought this was like the hardest area I'm like oh my god there's a whole lot of letters missing there and this is before I even scrubbed it so I knew it was going to get much worse and it did I mean there's like problems way down in here and I was kind of a noob at the time I didn't realize that that they actually cut these little grooves in here 
So I actually tried some JB Weld and this chunk over here. I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and fix that and make it, make it look nice. So I, that was my first thing, was adding some JB Weld in there and then scraping and sanding those flat. And it doesn't hurt, the ball rolls over those just fine and filled in these little gouges and chips and started to get a little more confident. You do a little more. Now I added the off-white color over the top of that and covered over most of my JB Weld stuff there. Still afraid of the letters up there. I'm going to leave that. I'm going to move up there slowly and gain my confidence. You know, there's a whole 2,000 missing right there. Yikes, but I got two, one on either side to look at. I start, well, maybe I'll see what the letters are going to Oh, that is going to be tough to do. <laughs> my X way too long on this side. You know, so added the, uh, some of the red in now around all of the insert of the uh, slots here, the switch slots. Added the orange around the top now. So, and the, some of that black, see there, how it changed around the top. And got the nerve to do the white letters and fixed up the USA a little bit. It didn't look too bad. Started working on this, but figured, well, the yellow is going to be hard to paint over the black. It, so I'm going to just paint the yellow in and I'll put black in around it. And start doing some of the black in around these areas. And all these little stars were cool. It's just little white dabs. You just go around your with your white brush. That was really easy. <laughs> it was nice to have something easy to do every once in a while because it was getting extremely difficult. And this was after the touch-up was complete over the entire area. And this was after clear coating. Nice. I thought it turned out pretty good. Oh, this one. Then I came on this part and I thought, well, that last part wasn't the hardest. This is going to be the hardest. <laughs> Have you ever seen so many concentric circles in your whole life? as there are right in here. It, oh man, as I looked at it closer in pictures of other people's play field that actually had a, that section there so I knew what colors and what shapes needed to be and how all this needed to look. So I'd have a mental, you know, visual reference. And I started in and, and uh, clean out it and it got even worse. I mean, it went from that to that. I mean, that, that's a lot of paint that came off in the area because it just gets beat to hell between those flippers. This is the hands down hardest hit part of the play field on Space Shuttle. Started putting some gray in here. Started thinking about how the heck am I going to do all these little thin lines across here. That was going to be fun. <laughs> came up with a pretty good solution. I'll tell you about it in a minute. The gray areas that go in between, the little crosses in between. I started painting those, the ones that were missing, gray. Some of the outer rings of these were gray, so I did those. Add some red. Again, everything looks just really sloppy right now because the black is what's going to add the definition. There were some little red niches, you know, here and here, little red streaks there. How about some light blue? There's light blue hiding behind here. There's some in the all th these outer rings. And they're just not just one circle here, there's like four or five circles, starting with the one that goes around the insert, the one that goes around that, the one that goes around that. I mean, it's just circle hell. And some more, the blue down here on the bottom. Adding some orange now. This is where the numbers that, there actually are supposed to be numbers in all these little places here. That's where your bonus is held. And so all these orange areas I added in. And I'm doing other parts of the play field at the same time. You see this stuff up above um, getting more mature too. And that's after adding the almighty white and black, the final two. Get the white on top of here and get all those numbers. And all the black to make all these perfect. And lots and lots of retries. But, and then thin line like that going around, that was just mad. Very hard to do. But... And then all the blue around it came out too. And there's after clear coating. Wow. Then I found the real hardest part of the play field <laughs> after all those other ones. And there was a reason why I waited to do some of these things. I'm like, holy cow, this is terrible. And then I scrubbed it and it got even more terrible. I'm like, oh my God, look at all the stars I'm going to have to make. Look at all the letters I have to redo. All these little fine concentric circles. The shuttle and all this stuff in here, that's no problem. That'll be a, be cake. So I'm gonna start with some 
grays and do my grays around there and I'm going to start trying to figure this stuff out. Oh, by the way, I'm going to back up just a hair. How did I do these little lines in here? I actually got a zig pen. They're a very permanent, you know, like a, like a photographic restoring kind of marker and they make them in super fine points. And then I just took a ruler. Once I got all the gray painted and everything done, I just took a ruler and I made the black lines with a zig pen across there. And they did perfect. It worked out really great. Okay, and so now we're back to this. We're getting some gray in there. We're adding some red now and trying to save as much of, I didn't want to just go in here and just wholesale dunk. I'm gonna try and leave some some uh, pinholes and some dots to connect and try and remake these letters. So I just tried to paint all the red in between and just meticulously started right here and just you know work your way around and come all the way back to where you started from. And it was difficult, but I got it done. And now you see my, all I got left are them wonky stars. And that's, you do, you make them big, ugly, and white, and then you come back with the blue and fix them up and hope you can do them that well. I think that just, that, I was so proud of that. I just thought it turned out spectacular, and then we clear coated it. Gorgeous yes. work. Well, thank you. You know, I, I was at the Northwest Pinball and Arcade Show, and I was showing some of my space shuttle pictures just as part of another presentation, just to show some of the things that I do touch up and work in this and doing that. And John Yousey was in the audience, and he, I noticed him looking over there, and he was he had his arms folded, and, and he was leaning back, and afterwards he made a point of coming up and telling me that's that's probably the finest touch-up work I've ever seen. Oh, and I thought, wow, that's high praise. <laughs> so we went from this. This is the lowest part of the play field, all cleaned and scrubbed. This is after all the dirt's off and just showing you how much paint was missing. Really bad down in here. Oh, nasty. You know, we have all kinds of problems in the in lanes and things. Going up the play field, that got, you know, destroyed. You got, you know, ball marks coming up into these. These guys were kind of beat up. There was a lot of chunks and lots of stuff missing in the black all over the place. Onto the top where I had a big problem up here and around the top of the pop bumpers. To this is after touch up the bottom. And what I do, I, I would mount my play field so I wouldn't have to take everything off the bottom when I send it off to be clear coated because I don't do clear coating. And I had a guy that did automotive clear coating do it for me. And I wanted to make it very easy for him and not have him worry about what he'd do to the back or anything that was attached to the back. So I made a deep plywood box that I could then mount my play field on just like it was sitting in my cabinet where it, just, it came up just above the edge of the, of the box and it fastened with L brackets underneath. And then I put a back on it and I put handles on either end of it and it still had all of the underside components. Nothing that protruded through the play field was still on there. I had like my slingshots and things just disconnected and tie wrapped to the harness underneath. And then I took this, this uh, tape blue painter's tape and from underneath I paint, I, I attached it so that any of the clear and all that stuff and when they, they did sanding and wet sanding in between it wouldn't go through and get all my stuff behind. And so that's, that's what you see this blue tape here. Touched up towards the middle and you can see why I saved that for last. And up through into the blacks and all these guys, all this stuff, every single little explosion, all the white in that was redone and up to the top. And then we clear coated it all. So this is starting from the bottom of the clear coat. And up to the middle. And up through the top. And I'm all done. Mm -hmm. Hope I didn't bore you guys too much. But I can talk about pinball for a long, long times. That's why they put me at 8 o'clock at night, so they know I can talk however long you guys care to listen. So. The, the plastics, um, I, they get clear coated too, the inserts. Yes. They get clear coated. You took that top piece out, because is that one of them that go up by the flippers? Yes. Is, how did, did you like fix that, buy a new one to shine up the plastic or make the, like redo the plastic? Well, this this game was a complete restore. I mean, 
from the bottom up. I took things off and polished them with Brasso and things like that and made them just sparkle. The and plastics. Everything, flip, any wear, wear part, which a flipper is part, wear, wear part. New flipper bats, new flipper bushings that the, that the plastic that protrudes up through the play field that the shaft is inserted into, all flipper rebuild kits, the elbow pieces, all the plungers, all the coil stops, all those sorts of things were new. Um, slingshots, you know, I took the, the, the nylon piece that actually kicks the rubber out, I took those out and scrubbed them with those scotch brights and cleaned them up and polished the parts. I, I have a ton of pictures of my space shuttle restoration from everything from plungers up on, all the way up and how I, I painted the back of the play field even. I, I primed it gray and, and put white around the holes just like they did at the factory, the, the eject holes and things like that. And yeah, anything that anything that protruded through the play field had to come down and either hang below or be removed. And then anything that was a wear part, which is you know some of the pop bumper, uh, not not the ring and rod assemblies, but the um, the yokes that they attach to under the play field. The metal ones are always breaking on Williams ones. So and I probably put new uh, fiber yokes in because those just get chewed up a little bit. Um, but yeah, the flippers, all the, anything that came through the play field had to be taped shut from underneath. The hole had to be taped shut, and it, it worked out really well. It, those, those plastic parts, even coil sleeves and things like that, they're, it's just where they're not, you know, when you're, it's how much time it takes to do them. You can take a Scotch-Brite, and I, I've taken them and put them on a piece of paper towel and read them with mean green and work their way through and twisting them like I'm screwing them into a, a coil sleeve and bring it back out and do that a few times. It, it's just so much work to make them look clean, and it's so easy to just get one out of the cabinet that costs 40 cents and put it in there. And I've, I've just gotten to where I just toss those little blackened boogers in the trash. Thank you, sir. I'm getting too old. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Is there